Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar on Bioinformatics Scope and its Applications presented to you by School of Life Sciences, B.S. Abdul Rahman, Crescent Institute of Science and Technology in association with the Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology. The first session of the webinar is titled Resources and Databases of Bioinformatics which is presented to you by Dr. Sudhar Kodi Sukumar, myself and Assistant Professor, the School of Life Sciences, Crescent Institute. The agenda for the first session is, we'll have a brief introduction on bioinformatics, the objectives, the various resources, that is the databases, and also some examples will be discussed for the databases. Finally, we will end with the summary of the session. Now. Where do we get data in biology and what is the need for a subject called bioinformatics? We all very well know about the central dogma of molecular biology which states that the DNA sequence is first transcripted to the RNA sequence that is the messenger RNA which is then translated to the protein that is the amino acid sequence. So you can see there is data at every stage of the central talk. Keeping this in mind, the first definition for bioinformatics was given by Pauline Ogwick and Ben Hesker in 1970. They defined it as simply as the study of information processes in biotic systems. Now, today with lots of development in the different technologies that are applied in biology, be it biochemical technology, genetic engineering, genomics, etc. The amount of data that we have in hand is huge. Do you think this definition of bioinformatics is applicable to that? The answer is no. As we can see, the genes, the DNA sequences, further the genome, that is the collection of all the genes present in a cell. That is a huge set of data. And further, the genome that varies from one organism to another adds further amount of data. As we go further, we have the expression data of genes, proteins and metabolites like carbohydrates, lipids, etc. Further, we have the protein which have their own hierarchical data that is primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure etc. Further we have the drug molecules which interact with these macromolecules like protein, genes and they have created a large set of data. Finally we have the systems concept where there is an interaction between all these different types of data. Now to address or analyze these data, bioinformatics needs to be defined at a further higher level. So we have a definition here by Luscom et al. published in 2001 where they say bioinformatics is conceptualizing biology in terms of macromolecules that is our DNA proteins and other metabolites and then applying information techniques which is not restricted only to computer science but also to apply maths and statistics in order to understand and organize the information associated with these macromolecules. Once again, bioinformatics is defined as the conceptualization of biology in terms of macromolecules, applying information techniques in order to understand the various information associ associated with the Biomolecules. Now, what are the objectives of bioinformatics and why do we need to use bioinformatics? With the help of bioinformatics, we can collect, store data, retrieve them, and consistently update them from time to time. We can also develop algorithms and tools to analyze these data. Once we do that, we are able to achieve narrow hypothesis and better research questions which can be used to design new experiments. After the completion of experiments, we can integrate the various data and 
make sense of that data which will further help us to understand the biological processes. In order to achieve these objectives, we need various resources. So the resources of bioinformatics can be broadly seen as the databases, algorithms and software tools. And finally, we also have integrated platforms, which is a combination of databases and tools. In this session, we will focus on databases primarily and other integrated platforms that are available. Now, how do we define a database? Be it a biological database or any database. We can put it as a structured collection storage of data, that is biological data, which is regularly updated with the opportunity for cross-referencing. So cross-referencing, we will discuss that later in example. Now, where do we get biological information from? Like scientific experiments that are performed in the laboratory by researchers. We can also get data from previous published literature. And recently, we have high throughput technologies like the next generation sequencing and other omics platforms. This database concept of biology did not start recently, but way back in 1965 itself, when Margaret Dayhoff, who is considered as the first bioinformatician, published the first protein sequence database called Atlas of Protein Sequence and Structure along with EC. She is also attributed for developing the first bioinformatics software called Comprot. But today we have come so far that there are a large number of databases out there. But the first credit has to be given to Margaret Payoff. Now databases have certain features. What are they? Databases have autonomous based on the maintainer state, meaning whoever develops a database, they hold all the responsibility of maintaining it, updating it, etc. So the databases can be developed by large academic institutions like SCBI, which we will discuss shortly, or it can be from a single academic group, that is a research group headed by a professor, or it could be by a scientist alone or it could be by a commercial company. Depending upon the maintainer status, the databases either can be open access that is freely available for use or it can be charged for use. Databases are said to be dynamic because they are constantly updated with new data and it is important that every database enables retrieval. Retrieval is collecting information. So this is also possible in biological databases because we have user-friendly web interfaces where we can use text query to retrieve data. Further, the different data can be downloaded in different file formats. Here we use the term heterogeneous file formats because biological data as we earlier saw in the central dogma, there are different types of data. So there are different types of file formats available out there. Now having seen the features, let's get into the classification. The main types of databases are primary databases and secondary databases. Primary database is defined as those databases that contain data which are directly submitted by the researchers and scientists who actually performed experiments. We can say they are the raw data of nucleotide sequences, protein sequences, or even structural information of macromolecules. That is why they are also referred to as archival databases. There are several examples like GenBank, Protein Data Bank, etc. Now, secondary database, on the other hand, contains results that are obtained by analyzing data from primary database. So you hear there is no direct submission of raw data. So it is only we obtain data from other primary databases, analyze them and present it in a better form or a other useful format for the 
researches. Now this database is also called as curated or knowledge based databases. So here the word curation means you are trying to analyze and add information to the existing primary database. The examples here are Interpro, ProSite, Ensemble, etc. Now, other than this classification, we can also look at biological databases in terms of the content. What do they have? For example, we have nucleotide databases which contains nucleotide sequences. We have, for example, protein structure databases which has structural information on the protein conformation, the 3D structure. We can have genome databases, small molecules and drug databases. We have even literature databases like PubMed, Web of Science. So other than this, one can always go to Google search or look through literature and find databases based on their content. So we will see some examples also. So the first example I have here is the protein data bank, which we already told is a primary database hosted by the RCSB. So this is the first open access digital database in biology and medicine. And it contains structural information, that is the 3D shapes of proteins, nucleic acids, and complex assemblies, that is complex of proteins and ligands of proteins and drugs, etc. As you can see, it has the option of depositing, meaning since it is a primary database, researchers can submit data that they obtain from experiments. So here we have one particular example, the 3D structure of a C-terminal domain of a protein from a feline coronavirus. Here you have information on the authors who submitted the data and also the method by which they generated data. For example, in the case of protein structure determination, we have X-ray diffraction. So they have given that information also. Further, we are able to download data, so which is an important feature which we already discussed for biological data. So here we can download information like we have the FASTA sequence. So you can obtain the protein sequence, that is amino acid sequence of this particular protein. We can also download this 3D structure in a format called the PDB format. Now, in general, the FASTA file format looks like this. So, you have a description line which starts with the greater than symbol. The next line is where the actual amino acid sequence or nucleotide sequence will start. So, this format can be easily downloaded as a text file and it is the most common file format used for storing nucleotide and protein sequences. It is important to know about this file format because later when you are going to use different tools and perform analysis, this is very useful format. The next format that is downloadable in PDB is called the PDB file format. So in this file format, you can get a structural data information. So here you can see there is several lines of information. Each line is called as a record. So in the beginning, we have a header section which has information about the name of the protein, which by which method this protein structure was determined in which uh, bacterium this protein was expressed and purified and also the authors, the researchers who determined the structure and submitted the data. Further, we have other sections of this uh, format. So, I have just taken the screenshots of different sections of this PDB file format. One has to remember that this runs for several pages. So, I have just taken few sections for your understanding. So here we have a section where it, the record says atom. So here it gives you the x, y, z coordinates of every atom present in every amino acid of this protein. So this information is very crucial in determining the 3D structure. So now this is about a primary database and the different file formats associated with it. Next we will move on to Another database example, which is Uniprot, which is also a protein database. 
and which shares information from other protein databases like SwissProt and Tremble. And UniProt is a very important and a large resource for people to look for protein related information. Now, UniProt can be called as a secondary database because it gives you information on protein sequences that are collected from other databases and they are curated. So here the score, annotation score, annotation meaning adding information on sequences is shown. But here there is a caution because some people might say Uniprot is a primary database because it also has the option of submitting peptide sequences directly by researchers. So on a safer side, we will say uh, Uniprot is a hybrid database. Okay. So here we have an example to show that Uniprot is a secondary database. So a secondary database will provide analysis of primary database information. So here uh, we have the 3D structure for a particular protein. And all possible 3D structures that are available for this particular protein. There are other information that has been collected for all these 3D structures. These are all collected information from PD, which is a primary database. It also provides links to these primary database. Other than this, in Uniprot, it also gives uh, information on the binding sites, active sites present in a protein. So these informations have been collected from another website like ProSec and it also provides links to ProSec. So we have seen how a primary database looks like in the form of PDB. We have also looked at Uniprot, another large protein sequence resource, how a secondary database looks like for an example. Next we will move on to other examples like genome databases. So I have given you screenshots from three different genome databases like mouse, Flybase, which is for Drosophila melanogaster. Then we have Orisa Base for us. So each of these websites provide downloads option for the genome information. It provides links, hyperlinks, cross links to other databases. It also has tools to analyze information. Other examples are literature databases. I have presented you three screenshots from three different databases like PubMed, which is part of NCBI. Web of Science, Google Scholar is a specialized search engine to give you information on articles related to any topic. It's not just biology, but any topic. Then we have examples for metabolic pathway databases like KEG, MetaPsych, BioPsych. KEG is a very important resource for biologists. Now, till this point, we have looked at individual database examples. Now we will move on to integrated platforms like NCBI. So integrated platforms has is a one place for databases as well as tools. NCBI is the National Center for Biotechnology Information established in 1988 under the National Library of Medicine at National Institute of Health USA. It's a very large academic institution funded by the US government. The mission of NCBI is to develop information technologies to understand biological process in order to support or control health and disease research. NCBI is a very uh, large online repository and it is the most important resource, online resource for researchers in biology or any other science for that matter. NCBI has a large collection of databases. It has primary databases, so hence this option of submitting direct raw data. It has the option of downloading information, that is retrieving data. It also has the option of analyzing using different tools. It also gives the option for uh, researchers to learn by way of tutorials. Today we will quickly do a search in NCBI and see what type of information are retrieved. The search term that I have used is coronavirus since it is the hottest topic now. I have got 
results from 21 different databases under different categories like literature. So we have E26 articles that are related to the term coronavirus in PubMed and others. We will move on to this particular example. Under nucleotide databases, there are 11,952 results. I've just picked up one result which gives us the coronavirus genome information of the Wuhan isolate. Now, this information is present in the GenBank database. So, GenBank is a primary nucleotide sequence database of NCBI. The other primary nucleotide sequence databases are DDBJ and European Nucleotide Archive. These three databases together form a collaboration because they get genome information every day. So, they share this information among themselves so that no information is missed in any of these databases. Now, GenBank has its own file format, which is a GenBank flat file format, which just like PDB has different sections, the header, the feature section, and the sequence section. Header section has uh, information on the authors who directly submitted this data and other general information. Feature section gives information on the coding regions, etc. Then we have the sequence section, which actually gives the nucleotide sequence for part this particular protein or gene or genome, etc. Other than NCBI, we have another integrated platform called the EBI, European Bioinformatics Institute, but which is part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Like NCBI, EBI is also a very large uh, repository which gives free information and tools. So they collect information from different laboratories and researchers. They archive it, they classify the information, put it in different databases and they share this data with others. They also give you the option of analyzing it by way of bioinformatics. So this brings us to the end of this session where we have learned about bioinformatics, the need for bioinformatics, the different resources and databases that are available. So all these resources can be easily accessed by a simple Google search or you can get it from literature also. Thank you for your attention. I hope this session was useful. If you have any questions or suggestions, Please drop an email. Thank you.